Um, so welcome everybody to uh, our English evening from OP conference and it is my my honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Grady Booch uh, to the show. Uh, so Grady, do you want to say a few words about yourself and what, what you've been working on? Sure. Uh, so I serve as chief scientist for software engineering at uh, um, IBM Research. Oops, am I muted? Oops, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. So I serve as chief scientist for software engineering at IBM Research. I have been with IBM since 2003 when they acquired a company I helped start back in 82 of all things, a company called First Rational Machines and Rational Software. So I've been doing what I do since, gosh, the early 80s, even pre-internet. My first email address was 1979 of all things. So these days I do a handful of things. I work with customers, uh, helping them architect really, really large software systems. I'm working on a number of interesting research projects associated with what I'd call hybrid neural symbolic computation. <clears throat> That's led me to some really fascinating efforts we're doing in the area of robotics and avatars and devices, devices such as uh, the Mayflower project, which I think we'll talk about later. And uh, gosh, what else? Uh, also trying to get a couple of books out in the world. Uh, one on uh, architecture and the other on a project we call um, the uh, uh, computing the human experience, sort of the intersection of computing and what it means to be human. We'll talk more about that later too. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, so when when we did the chat to prepare this um, this conversation, um, I realized that that you you did those talks about AI and architecture for AI and also a lot of work on AI. And uh, these days, um, AI seems to be mostly about deep learning and neural networks. And there are also symbolic approaches, uh, which you pointed out in, in the preparation. So what are those? You bet. Well, the way I define it is that deep learning is one thing and it is a subset of machine learning. And machine learning is a subset of AI. So there are many ways to approach the problem, especially when we see it historically, starting with the work of, let's say, uh, Newell and Simon, which was purely symbolic and, and very formal in its nature. Uh, we morphed then to the works of Ed Feigenbaum, for example, to sort of name major, major epochs in the history. Uh, Ed and his colleagues primarily working on what we call knowledge engineering or rules-based system. Mm. Prior to that time, you know, Minsky and others had, had been dabbling in the area of neural networks, but there wasn't sufficient computational power and perhaps even an understanding of the mathematics behind it for it to go very, very far. But in the last decade, there was the perfect storm of uh, in, in advance of computational resources, mostly in the form of GPUs, together with the presence of massive amounts of data. And those two I believe enabled the current revolution in deep learning. So everybody talks about deep learning as AI, but it's truly just a subset. Uh, Watson Jeopardy was, for example, uh, more of a statistical system, statistical AI than it was a deep learning system. Uh, AlphaGo is primarily uh, neural networks, but I see the pendulum swing back and forth. And my current interest in the interest of some others is how does one weave those two together? How do you bring together symbolic models of computation together with neural models of computation? Each have their own strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you just mentioned AlphaGo, which is, I think, the first machine to beat uh, a human in, in the game of Go. Is, is that it? Um, to beat the best humans in the game. And oh, I there's see. A delightful doc yeah, del there's a delightful documentary. There are, there are lots of other go playing games that will be you know, less than great players it would be not difficult for you to beat me in go because i completely do not understand the game uh, but the fact that it beat the best humans is amazing one of the gentlemen uh, was interviewed and he said you know he was just stunned by it he felt that that alpha go did things that were just brilliantly creative i have a theory about that let me let me chat about that notion of creativity for a moment Gary Marcus, a uh, dear colleague of mine, uh, follow him on Twitter, he's doing some cool stuff. He and Rodney Brooks have started up the company. He's been a critic of, of models such as GPT-3 and the like, and I actually agree with him, because there are clear limitations to, to what can be done. Um, 
he, I made the observation in looking at AlphaGo that there is a very large landscape in the game mm. of Go. It's very, very multidimensional. It's you know got peaks and valleys. Human tradition and human experience have led us down a number of very well-trodden paths. You go study Go from a master, and he or she will give you certain practices. But AlphaGo was not constrained by that. AlphaGo was able to step back to the entire multidimensional landscape and say, wow, here's some valleys we've never looked at before. And they look promising and drop this in there. So I think that's why the humans viewed it as surprising. And so we see it as creative, but from an implementation point of view, Yep. That was my machine. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> I, I was just afraid that, that there was some problem on my oh. side. Um, okay, so so um, is is um, is some, is a symbolic approach fundamentally different from what we're doing with neural networks and deep learning? I mean, um, I, today I heard the the definition of AI as something that learns. Is that something that you would agree on? So is learning inherently uh, a part of an AI system, or are there other ways to create something that we would call AI? To par paraphrase Bill Clinton, it depends upon what you mean by the meaning of the word is. It is <laughs> fundamental. So, so how, what, how is fundamental? Symbolic approaches to computation and neural approaches to computation are computationally similar. They're both Turing complete. What's different is how we as humans can reason about them and how they become manifest at the next level in our machine. So I could just as easily write a, not easily, but I could write a facial recognition system in C++ if I wanted to versus a neural network. This so happens that a neural network is far more convenient for me to write it in terms of levels of abstraction. So have to be careful about what we mean by fundamental on the the, the the obvious difference is that one uses a computational fabric that assumes the presence of, uh, let's say, probabilities associated with neural threshold. That's the that's the deep learning side of it, and it's led to a lot of really wonderful mathematical understanding of how those things work. On the other hand, the symbolic side is very very different. Generally, it's statistically based, but it approaches it based upon more of a logical approach. There's a colleague of mine at IBM, um, Alexander Gray, who's trying to combine those two using a technique he calls LNN, logical neural networks, which have as their substrate uh, neuro neurons due to computation, but then on the edges, the formation of the weights, they're all purely symbolic in nature. So the symbolic uh, neural combinations can happen at a number of levels. I'm approaching it with a thing called self at a little bit higher level of abstraction, which says that the overall architecture of the system is symbolic and its pieces might be neural, which, by the way, this could be a topic unto itself, leads to some really interesting philosophical discussions about how the brain itself is structured. At least we as humans understand brains from a very symbolic partitioning kind of way. We see the visual cortex, we see all these various parts. But at the bottom, it's all neurons. So we structure it symbolically, but it gets mm -hmm. implemented neurally. Um, it may be a limitation to us humans. So you just mentioned the, the self project. So, project. so what, what is that? What, What's happening is that uh, I'm getting email on one of my, my uh, uh, email programs. I'm going to shut down here. And for some reason, it's getting batched in a, an audio buffer, and then all of a sudden releases out this message. So anyway, I just shut it off, so I won't interrupt this again. Okay, cool. Uh, so you just mentioned the the Ceph project that you're working on. Uh, so yep. what what is it, and and what you what are you aiming for? So Self is a system that I began with my colleagues in our Austin laboratories a few years ago, that first started because of work we were doing with Hilton Hotels to try to build a humanoid concierge. We were using the Alder Baron robot now. Uh, behind me, if you can see it, is its big sister. Uh, this is the Pepper robot. The, the uh, now is a little bit smaller leg version of it. We found in the process that we could do some interesting things using just conversational approaches. 
but it didn't have this sense of liveness. So I began toying with some ideas around blackboards and we implemented it and it was successful. But around the same time, we were doing some work with NASA's um, Johnson Space Center in their robotics work for their mission to Mars. At the time, it was the Robonaut 2, which was on board the International Space Station. And that problem had two really interesting characteristics. The problem of going to, going to Mars had two interesting characteristics. First, because of the speed of light issues, you can't rely upon uh, mission control on the ground. You've got to take it with you. This is the HAL scenario. You need to have a cognitive assistant in the walls of the Orion spacecraft, minus the homicidal use cases. That's not a good thing. And additionally, NASA had in mind putting robots on the surface of Mars before the humans and to serve later as scientific associates. Mm. I literally sat down one afternoon. Remember my background, I'm not a neuroscientist, but my background is in architecture. So I sat down one afternoon, I said, I think I know how to architect this. And this was born of blackboard architecture that we actually used to work against the Robonaut 2, Soul Machines as avatars, ABB's robots. We put it on a lot of small things, very powerful stuff. And we eventually turned it open source. It's a combination of two AI ideas. Marvin Minsky Society of Mind, which is a massive, um, uh, massive uh, agent-based system, together with Rodney Brooks's idea of uh, representation uh, in his notion of subsumption architectures. Sprinkle in a little bit of Gary Marcus's idea of adherency, throw in Douglas Hofstetter's ideas of strange loops. That's what self is. It's written, originally it was written in C++. It was this big ball of mud. And every time we needed to add an agent, you had to recompile the thing. So the major architectural change I've done now is to rewrite it all in Python. I have colleagues who are also <coughs> writing it in Swift, C++, and Java, because the way the agents will communicate with one another is via microservices. So we're taking, mm -hmm. it actually runs on a, a Kubernetes infrastructure of all things. And agents are containers themselves that run independently. So you talk about neural symbolic, this is AI at Kubernetes scale. And uh, so, so is it being used in, in this concierge uh, scenario or are you planning to, to take those uh, robots to Mars with it or, or what's the it, status concerning it, that? The Hilton, pro the Hilton project is, is long over. Uh, the NASA project, uh, we're not currently working with NASA. A company called Woodside, an oil and gas company, continued on after our work. Uh, most of what I was doing was kind of shut down, so it's mostly just me continuing on, on the effort. And uh, as a fellow at IBM, I have lots of degrees of freedom to do fun stuff, and this is, this I think is the right and interesting thing. I'm actually collaborating with three other research teams in IBM who are trying to apply it in some external groups as well, too. So think of it as uh, an exploration in architecture, and it's an experiment. So before we, we dive deeper, uh, deeper into this, there is a question that, that I think is quite interesting on, on YouTube by Jorge Alberto de Flon. I hope I got that right. Um, and the question is, do you think that the robotic programmer is near? So as a child, think of it as uh, just, hang on, an here. exploration. Oh, there we go. As, as a child, I was heavily influenced by Asimov and his book, I, Robot. And I'm reminded of the character, Dr. Susan Calvin, who was uh, a robo-psychologist. There's an interesting change going on in, in industrial robotics. If you look at most of the robots by companies such as ABB, robots that build cars, they're incredible devices that have, you know, sub-micron uh, tolerances. But to retool it requires a tremendous amount of human intervention. You can get it precisely right. You can do it thousands of times over and over again, but it doesn't learn. There was work by Rodney Brooks uh, around a system called Baxter, which was shut down, to try to build a robot that would learn by watching humans. And I think that's the right and interesting kind of path. Uh, this is also along the ideas of, of having a cobot, a robot that doesn't fully act aut autonomously, but rather works in conjunction with a human. This is the direction I see Boston Dynamics going with Spot, for example. Spot is semi-autonomous, but we're seeing a number of use cases where it sits side by side with a human. So 
to go back to your question, are we going to see robot programmers? The answer is we are sort of already see them. And the nature of that relationship is one that's still very fluid right now. Are we the director of these robots or are we working in conjunction with them? And I believe all signs point toward the latter that will move in that direction. So you're saying that, that uh, the, uh, if a robot behaves like a human by looking at a, at a human, that's uh, how, how they do sort of programming, something similar to programming. Is, is that what you're saying? That's, that's one research path that a number of follow, are following, correct, mm -hmm. to learn by doing, if you will. There is within uh, many organic neural systems these things called mirror neurons And you'll see it in the growth of a young young creature, a young child, where they will observe another creature doing this thing and they'll mirror it. And these mirror neurons seem to be the ones that get activated along the way. It's not like we're implementing it that same way, but it's the same concept of we're sort of watching and observing and repeating. Um, it's interesting. I'm, I think your, your answer is quite interesting because If I look at the at the history of software engineering, I always feel like what what we are trying to do is uh, raise the level of abstraction, and I yes. I, I always have the uh, I mean in my day to day work the struggle that I usually have is uh, to understand what needs to be built. Uh, so it's not about I mean I'm a consultant, so I hardly build anything. It's more about you know trying to to get a direction, and that seems like something. So like a, like a robotic programmer doesn't really seem to solve the problem of software engineering, which is to understand what needs to be built. Uh, so would you agree or is that a problem that can be tackled by AI at all? Um, lots of interesting implications to that question. I think what you're describing is a separation of concerns within such a system. There are those who build the infrastructure for such devices. And then there are those who use that infrastructure to educate slash teach such a system. Uh, it's not unlike the dichotomy we see today in a lot of visual based AI systems where you have the data scientists who collect the ground information for the ground truth and do the training through all the epochs. And then you've got software developers, neural software developers who are the ones who are creating the architecture of the neural networks themselves. In the latter case, there is emerging pattern languages. Uh, I referred to in my lecture the other day, uh, I can get you a high paying job. Today, if you have skills in COBOL, I can get you a high paying job. The point being that symbolic models of computation are going to outlive you, I assure you, and they already do. So it's not like AI is going to take over the world by any means, but there's going to be a, a, a healthy, truce between the two, a relationship between the two. So you have to choose your path. My expectation is that the problem will be less so, how do I engineer an AI, but more so, how do I engineer a system that has AI components within it? Not unlike, how do I engineer a system that has UI components? A wonderful dance between the two, but in the end, it's all about engineering. And so your traditional skills of How do I build these things? That's great. If you want to be a, 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 um, a deep learning expert, go for it. That's also an interesting, fruitful path. But I think by and large, a lot of the code we're going to write uses AI and is not AI per se. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so that's kind of a relief. And, and um, the, the, yeah, and, and I have to admit the, uh, what you just said about COBOL and Uh, IBM uh, assembly that that's that's a very good point um, so listening to, to what you just said about about self uh, about Marvin Minsky's society of mind and uh, Brooks intelligence without representation I think you also mentioned uh, the strange loops by Hofstetter if I remember correctly um, mm -hmm. that's that's stuff from like the 80s and the 90s I believe so so is there like 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 a gap somewhere in AI research where uh, we, we need to rediscover things from, from that per, uh, period and uh, we need to apply them anew with the new possibilities that we have concerning hardware and computational power and these kinds of things? I think that the field of software 
in truly any field is one of rediscovery of the past. I'll give you another example. Um, we as a community in the cloud world are beginning to rediscover the importance of visual programming. Oh my God, remember this thing called the UML. You may have heard of these three, three rogues. Don't trust them, they're, they're, they're scoundrels. They created this thing called the UML, which was at its peak, a way to visually represent complex systems. Well, maybe 10% of the community sort of grokked it. I still use it, it's still used here and there. Uh, didn't like dominate the whole world. But now if you go into an AWS shop and say, hey, show me your layout of your cloud, they're gonna show you a diagram based around an AWS notation. That's sort of a combination of UML deployment diagrams and UML component diagrams. So the world is rediscovering those kinds of things. There's nothing new under the sun. That's true in cloud. Same thing is true in AI as well. Uh, the ideas of blackboards and, and knowledge engineering, they're all great ideas in their time. And there's no one true way. I tend to be a synthesizer. As a systems architect, I look at all the best ideas I can find to bring them together. And so that's why you see me reaching back a few decades because these ideas work and as an engineer, I want to pull those things together. So do you think that's that's sort of what it is sort of what it boils down to? If you're an engineer, you have to collect the, the ideas and and think about them and use the ones that fit to the problem at hand. The mantra I use as an engineer is that if it works, it's useful. And so I'm going to go with what works, no matter what era in which it was created. Mm -hmm. Um, you just mentioned uh, blackboards. That's another old idea, I believe, uh, or or um, well established idea. So, and I think it's it's fundamental to AI, probably. So, do you want to say a few words about that to to sort of deep dive into one of these ideas that that are maybe forgotten? Sure. Well, blackboards came about through a lot of audio AI research back in the '80s. Uh, I think it was first proposed in the concept, a system called hearsay, which was a statistical approach to, uh, to uh, uh, audio recognition, ALP, I guess you could call it. Um, Mary Shaw and David Garland in their book, Software Architecture, detail blackboards as one of the fundamental uh, architectural patterns. It's interesting to me because from the point of view of human cognition, we know that we have short-term memories and these are in effect really well modeled as blackboards. So there's a separation of concerns. There are sort of short cache kinds of things that uh, we have that we can throw on a blackboard and then longer term memory kind of things. Those are the models of the world, models of the self and models of others. And the interesting thing about the blackboard then is if you couple that with a multi-agent system, all of a sudden you have the opportunity for opportunistic behavior. This is exactly what drove us to this with the uh, Hilton Hotel example. Uh, we would put this robot out there and people wouldn't know what to do with it. But on the other hand, if you made it spontaneous, if you gave it some degree of agency, you would have one agent that says, I'm constantly looking around and I see a human and I'm gonna put that information up on the blackboard. If the context is right in that time and space, another agent might wake up and say, oh, wow, I'm not doing anything. I'm going to initiate a conversation. So a blackboard gave us a mechanism that allowed a sense of liveliness to it. So again, if it works, it's useful and it worked and it was useful. <laughs> So do you think that this is some, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that sounds like uh, agents basically could be modules in your traditional software and Blackboard could just be some kind of shared data structure. So is this useful beyond um, AI applications and uh, maybe something that we should take a closer look at also to, to use it for, for other architectures? I think it may possibly so. What I'm trying to do with self is to well, there's the Python implementation of it today. So if you want to snag those, you can do now. But I'm turning each of those abstractions into a set of containers with their own microservices. So we're, I'm, I'm trying to build out a set of abstractions that could be generally useful. If you need a Blackboard, here it is. A Redis, for example, doesn't have a Blackboard a metaphor in it, but hey, here's one that can go along. The thing about building anything like this, you never know how it's going to be used. I'm building it for a particular purpose. 
if it can be used beyond that, then all the better. Right. Um, just before we started, uh, you also um, you also talked about uh, the Mayflower project for for a second. So I'm just going to switch over to show uh, this Mayflower autonomous ship. Uh, so can you say a few words about that project and what that was all about? Yeah. The Mayflower is an autonomous vessel being built out by a shipping company called Promar. And it, it was delayed because of COVID. It's going to be taking, it's, it's doing sea trial. It's going to be taking a maiden voyage across from the UK to the United States across the North Atlantic. Uh, I, I, IBM have been engaged with the project for some time. They're using power PCs on board. My piece of it is associated with a scientific package. And I've been working with a team out of Hursley that have put a number of experiments on board. Living here in Maui, yes, I'm wearing a t-shirt and, and swim trunks. Sorry for all of you who are in cold weather right now, but it's really nice and warm. I'll send my warm tropical thoughts to you. Um, I've been working with a number of, uh, of whale researchers, Jim Darling in particular, another woman from a, a group called the Jupiter Foundation, Beth, uh, who are really deeply interested in humpback whales. So we've been, um, I collected uh, samples from them. Uh, thank you, Beth and Jim. Uh, we built some ground truth and have built, the team in Hersley has built out an AI, traditional CNNs that uh, allow us to detect uh, the songs of humpback whales and other things. And this is going to go on board. There are other experiments, but that's the one I've been involved with. And um, lastly, um, you also talked about uh, computing the human experience and there is the website yeah. computingthehumanexperience.com. Uh, so yeah. what is what is that about? That's another project of yours, right? Great question. Somebody asked me yesterday, are you going to retire? And the answer is, I got too many things fun <laughs> that I'm doing. And this is a particularly interesting one. Um, a few years ago, the then CEO of the Computer History Museum, I was in the Board of Trustees, approached me and said, hey, you know, we just you know landed this big deal with the Gates Foundation, woohoo. And in a little bit of a playful fashion, I said, well, that's great. What are you going to do for me today? Have you guys ever considered doing a documentary kind of like Carl Sagan's Cosmos? He looked at me and said, Grady, why don't you be our Carl? I said, I'm no Sagan. That's an intriguing idea. So the last really decade, I've been on a mission to try to build, uh, try to release to the public a 12 part documentary on the intersection of computing and the human experience. A little bit of science, a little bit of history, a lot of uh, uh, speculation, if you will. And so you can think of it as like Sagan's Cosmos, but about that intersection. So go visit the site. I've done a number of public lectures on it. And uh, if you happen to have five to $10 million burning a hole in your project, I'd be delighted to have you sponsor us to uh, bring this to production. Yeah, and I can also highly recommend the Computing History Museum right next to the Google campus oh, yeah. in, in Mountain View. I've been there yeah. and, and for a nerd like me, it was just, just heaven. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for uh, taking the time to be here. It was really a pleasure and very interesting. Uh, and uh, hope to see you again soon uh, somewhere. And right. have a great day uh, warm, over there everybody. in Stay Hawaii. Safe. Okay, All right. thanks. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Bye now.
and you and Hi there, welcome to the second interview of Software Architecture and Stream, OP edition, the English evening. My guest is Aino, and we will talk about retrospective. But because uh, be before we started, um, I want to tell you how to ask your questions. You have the YouTube, YouTube chat and Twitch chat as usual, but the guys joining from the um, conference platform can ask their questions by sending me a private message. Um, so you have the chance to send questions, which will be answered right in this interview. So, hi, Aino. I'm very pleased to meet you here. Um, could you introduce yourself a bit? Sure, I can. And thank you for inviting me, Lisa. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Aino Kori. I live in Denmark. I am actually Danish. And uh, I've just written a book about uh, retrospectives, anti-patterns, as you can see the front page and behind me. I am originally um, software Uh, developer, I've, I've taken, I, oh, I'm tired. I took a PhD in computer science 20 years ago, but that was focusing on theoretical, technical issues. But in the 20 years since then, I've been moving more and more towards communication and people and processes and things like that. I really like to try to make people communicate. And I've been facilitating retrospectives for 15 years. And I've made all the mistakes that you can possibly make when facilitating retrospectives. And that's why I decided to write a book about it. So maybe other people wouldn't make the same mistakes, or at least if they did, they could feel comfortable that I made the same mistake. <laughs> okay. Um, so why do you think retrospectives are important? And maybe you should um, explain retrospectives in, um, in a short way that everyone knows what it is. <laughs> yeah. So a retrospective, is a structured meeting for a team where you look back at what has happened and you share what you thought about the things that happened and you learn about what has happened and then you are able to change the way that you work together so that you can improve little by little. So there's the, the famous book by Diana Larson and Esther Darby, which is called Agile Retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great. And the subtitle um, invites you to think that even if you're a good team, you can become even better if you have retrospectives. And I think it's really important to have these retrospectives in order to improve the way that you're working. And even though I sometimes meet a team that says, we work fantastically together, we do everything right, we have the wonderful code reviews and we have continuous integration and, and we love to be together, we have such a good teamwork, you can always still improve. It's like if you were a skier, even professional skiers, they're always trying to improve. They're just trying to sort of improve a little bit here and a little bit there. And that's what you're doing with retrospectives. You have them continuously, maybe every second week, every third week, every month, depending on how often you want to have them. And every time you try to turn a little handle or you push a little button and you get a little bit better all the time. So the most benefit you can take out of a retrospective is get, getting better every time to summarize this uh, answer. Okay, um, and what can each of us do to make our retrospectives more efficient or more, more beneficial um, for each other? Yeah, so the whole book that I've written is aimed at retrospective facilitators. For every retrospective, there's a facilitator, there's somebody who made the agenda, who is introducing the activities, who is trying to lead the discussion, so not to a specific topic, but lead it so that the whole team decides together where should we go and lead it so that we actually get to finalize discussions and learn from them and get action points. But the people who are entering retrospectives can do something themselves. And that is the majority of the people, of course. Uh, most of us are just attending retrospectives But one thing that's very important when you're attending a retrospective is to have the right mindset. And the right mindset is that this is not a naming and blaming game. What you want to do when you are in a retrospective is that you want to share what has happened so that everybody learns from each other about what happened. That's a very powerful part of the retrospective, but also that you gain insights together. You try to learn from this And you figure out why did this why did this thing happen? What caused this thing to happen? Both the negative and the positive things. And the point is that if you 
enter the retrospective thinking, I want to find the scapegoat, I want to figure out who to blame, then people will be in opposition. They'll be trying to protect themselves because they know that perhaps they were the culprit this time, maybe they'll be the scapegoat and that'll feel bad. So if you can enter the retrospective thinking that everybody did the best they could at the time. Noam Kurth was the first one to, wrote, to write about project retrospectives and he had this prime directive that basically says everybody did the best they could at any time, um, depending on the resources they had at hand and what they knew and how they felt at the time. And I think that mindset for everybody entering a retrospective is extremely important because it allows people to relax enough so that they can share the things, even the things that sometimes they're a bit embarrassed about it or they're a bit mad about it or they're a bit sad about it. And these things need to be shared as well in the team so that you can grow together. Because if you in a team can't talk about the things that are difficult, then it's very, very difficult to, to be alert of the things that you need to change over time. Maybe people are stuck in some part of the code. Maybe they're stuck with the technology and they should use another technology. It's, it's very important to have that communication. Do you have any tips or tricks to get into the mindset or are there any um, activities at the beginning of a retrospective which can help me get into this mindset? That's a very good question, Lisa. And if I really knew the answer to that, I'd be rich. But I can tell you what I normally do. And if it's an in real life retrospective, I often write Norm Kurth's prime directive on a poster and bring it to the retrospective and put it on the wall. And then I point to that when we start the retrospective, I say, remember the prime directive, everybody did the best they could. If it's an online retrospective, I sometimes put it in the email invitation, the calendar invitation, either the, the words of the prime directive or just remember that we're trying to find faults in the system, not in the individuals or something like that. I was um, recently um, involved in a little LinkedIn discussion about whether you could find faults in the system instead of in the people. Because what, what, we, what some people said there was that actually the system is made up of people and that's, that's definitely true. And also that sometimes some people do screw up and sometimes some people are evil and that's really true as well. And I, I, I appreciate that sometimes it is somebody's fault, but I think it's valuable at least to try to have that mindset that we are trying to figure out how can we improve the way that we communicate? How can we improve our processes? How can we improve the circumstances for the individuals so that they can be perform the best they can, both technically, but also as team players. So reminding people about the prime directive when the retrospective starts is one way of doing it. And sometimes you need to remind them also in the middle of the retrospective, okay, remember we are trying to figure out how to how to solve the whole system of people and not pointing at individuals. But it's difficult because we're brought up with that. We're brought up with our parents asking who started that fight, who broke that vase, um, and my family, who left the milk out on the table from the breakfast, things like that. You mentioned a facilitator before who um, makes the agenda and so on. Um, do you think it's better to have one person in charge for every retrospective we do? Or do you think it's a good thing to, um, to uh, give the, uh, yeah, the, the glass around, so to say, um, to, to handle this um, facilitation person differently from each retrospective? Yeah, that's, that's also a very relevant question, Lisa, because a lot of people are struggling with exactly that. What I see in many um, companies using Agile and particularly Scrum is that it happens to be the Scrum Master who is facilitating the retrospectives and the, and the Scrum Master will be facilita facilitating all the retrospectives because the theory is that that is a part of their responsibility. I think that a part of the responsibility for a scrum master is to make sure that the retrospectives will happen on a regular basis. But I don't think it's a good idea to have the same person facilitate all the retrospectives for, for various reasons. If it's a scrum master who's always facilitating the retrospectives, then that person is playing two different roles of the retrospective. When you are a facilitator, as I said before, you're making the agenda for the retrospective. You have to be aware of the body language of the people, either in real life or if it's online like this, 
you have to be looking at them and see, do they want to say something? Do they, are they rolling their eyes because they think something is stupid? Are they angry about something? It's very important that the facilitator is looking at the body language to see whether we should stop this conversation or whether we should go in smaller groups instead of in plenum to have that conversation. And also, as I said before, the, um, the facilitator has the responsibility to move the discussions along so that we go through the retrospective and we, we gather the data, we generate insights, we decide what to do, and we decide about the right thing to do, and we focus on the right problems. And it all has to be done within that time box that you set aside for the retrospective, which is sometimes one and a half hours, sometimes two hours. That's a full-time job in a, in a retrospective. So if you are facilitating the retrospective, you don't really get anything out of it yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you say that the Scrum Master is part of the team, which I believe is the case, then the Scrum Master will never get anything out of the retrospective themselves because they're not part of the discussions, they're not part of the decision-making because they're focused on being a facilitator. If, on the other hand, they, they focus on being part of the team, so they go into the discussions, they spend time in the smaller breakout rooms and then they don't really have the possibility to also be aware of, of what's happening with the other people and being aware of time. When, like many years ago, when I was facilitating retrospectives for my own team, I would sometimes get lost in some of the discussions because they were very interesting for me because I was part of the team. And then I would forget that I was facilitating the retrospective. So I believe that it can happen once in a while, but then the scrum master will just be the facilitator. So if you could, in a team, either, as you said, pass the glass around so that other team members would facilitate from time to time, or even that you, that scrum masters help each other facilitate retrospective so that sometimes you facilitate for another team and somebody else facilitates for your team, or you can have an external facilitator uh, to come in from outside and, and uh, facilitate retrospectives. I, I do that for some companies where I facilitate every or every other or a retrospective or a retrospective every three months so yeah the short and answer is no <laughs> <laughs> i think it's very helpful because we do it on our team to pass the glass around and um, i thought it is a good thing but uh, i think we can improve the way we do our retrospectives um, uh, um a question popped up in the chat room um it's um regarding your um your story with the milk class and the finger pointing, the milk, uh, milk class, which was le left on the table in the kitchen. Um, can you add details about the impact of different cultural backgrounds on a retrospective? High context, low context, negative feedback habits, and so on. Yeah, there's a, there's, if I understand the question correct, the question is about um, how does different cultures um, like um, impact the retrospective? Yes. And, and different cultures have a huge impact on the retrospective, um, but also the other way around. I do believe that if what you can start in a retrospective of communication can spread out to the rest of at least the team's work and then sometimes perhaps also the organization. But it is, it is difficult to, um, it's difficult for a facilitator to facilitate somebody from a different culture than your own because you're not aware of the pitfalls that are there. And you might think that if people are happy and smiling and nodding, that's a very good sign because uh, it would be a good sign in Denmark because we would always complain. And I guess it's the same in Germany, right? You would be sure to complain. I mean, I, I mean that's, that's at least the German tourist story, right? Um, <laughs> but in other cultures, it is, it's more difficult for them to say something negative. Um, I, so what I do sometimes if I, if I facilitate retrospectives with different cultures is that I look at what can I do right now to help this problem. So if I cannot, if I cannot change the problem, if I cannot change their culture, the way they communicate, the way they feel, then I have to change the symptoms, right? And changing the symptoms means that I set up some sort of facilitation activities that does not allow them to fall into these bad habits. So for instance, if they're afraid of speaking up, then I make sure that we are either completely anonymous when they say something, when they have to say something bad, or I put them in smaller groups so that they don't have to say something in plenum. That sometimes helps that. 
if they're from a culture where it's about finding the culprit and blaming that and getting this person fired or sacked, I spend a lot of time on the Prime Directive in the beginning to explain why it's helpful for everybody, not just to find the one person who is guilty, but to figure out how can we create an environment that uh, prevents this mistakes or this failure from happening again, instead of just telling off the person. And I would also be very aware as a facilitator of what things came out and what how people communicated with each other. So I would, I would probably, as I said before, I'll probably do less in plenum and more in smaller groups. So at least it wouldn't affect that many people at a time. And I would make sure that if something comes up on a post-it note that's really negative, I would actually just throw that one away and then talk to people again. But also sometimes measuring safety can be a good idea. Uh, there's a lot of ways of measuring safety out there. One could be just ask them anonymously on a scale from one to five, how safe do you feel talking about things in this team, in this group? And then if you see that most people are not safe to say anything, then that's probably something you should work with. But as I said before, you need to figure out, can I change the problem or can I just help out the symptoms? And sometimes with a huge cultural difference, you can't change the problem. You just have to work around the symptoms. But sometimes if it's just within an organization, then perhaps you can look at how can we build more psychological safety in this team? How can we change the organizational culture to accept that um, people can say things that have gone wrong without being fired or without being ridiculed or without having their bonus taken away from them. And that could be, but that's a whole other issue about creating trust and psychological safety. Do you always, uh, do you also use these uh, safety methods for um, let's say European teams when they don't feel safe within their company? Yeah, I do that as well. Definitely. It's, it's not just different cultures naturally, uh, nationally, There's also different cultures in companies. And for instance, if I find a huge general difference between small startup companies and big uh, enterprise companies. So with big enterprise companies, they, they tend to have this uh, sort of, um, I would say almost masculine culture where we are having hierarchies and there are like rule sets. And, and if you say something stupid or you do something stupid, you're ridiculed and it's embarrassing. And the managers never doesn't do anything wrong. They're just like up here and always perfect. And there I have to really work hard on, uh, on that culture and try to make them work on the culture also outside the retrospectives, because there's only a limit to how much, You can change in the retrospective. You can only change the people who are there. Um, you can't change people outside the retrospective. So, but in startup companies, for instance, that normally, uh, again, in general, the culture is normally different because in a startup, you have to make a lot of mistakes and it's, it's a part of the innovation process. So they're more used to making mistakes and they're more used to making, to using mistakes as a learning tool instead of using mistakes as a blaming tool. If you know what I mean. I, I do know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I have another question regarding regarding myself. What would be the worst thing to do in a retrospective? I think the worst thing to do in a retrospective would be to laugh out loud at somebody else's pain. Have yeah. you have you uh, have you um experienced that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've, yeah, I think I've okay. I think I've tried everything terrible in a retrospective and and definitely the laughing is a problem um but even with laughing you can learn something from that if somebody is laughing at somebody else who's made a mistake or who's feeling bad about it uh then i think you should immediately um make a timeout stop the retrospective or change the setting you're in to to uh, safeguard the person who's being ridiculed Of course, some people like that other people laugh at them. It's like, it's like the bantering that they have in that team. But you can tell, well, that's something that is painful. And the, the reason why people laugh at that is also a very telltale sign about the culture and about perhaps what they're afraid of themselves, because some people use laughter as, um, as a tension remover. So if they're worried um, about talking about failures, And they start laughing at that. It's not necessary because they're evil people and, and they want to ridicule that person. It could also be that they just feel very uncomfortable with failure and talking about controversial things. 
and in that case it, it gives you it gives you knowledge about the person who laughed not necessarily that they're a bad person i mean they could be a bad person i, I wouldn't know that it's but sometimes it's it's also an interesting gift that you get more information about that person but you should of course try not to laugh at people who are in pain yes i i won't do it i hope <laughs> i don't think you would ever do that lisa <laughs> Um, how do you identify if the person who laughs is bad or just uncomfortable uncom with the situation? Do you have any key well, stuff which can be identified? Yeah, it, so I would say that I really try to live um, after the prime directive myself. So I would, if somebody laughed, always try to explain it as he or she is being uncomfortable instead of explaining it as he or she is being evil and stupid. So I would always at first hand try to interpret it as um, a weakness they're showing or that they're uncomfortable. And then I guess if, if it continues to be like that and you see that it's a trend, then maybe you need to talk to that person. And I think that for a lot of different personality types that can be negative in the retrospective, like the loud mouth who's saying too much or the silent one who's never saying anything or the negative one who's being very critical or laughing at other people. I think it's important to remember that you cannot solve that in the group of people. They will, you don't want people to lose face. You don't want to point at them and say, You're, you are wrong. You want to talk to them one-on-one -on -one between the retrospectives and say, well, this behavior that you're showing, it's uh, unfortunate. It has this effect on other people. Uh, so is there... Is there a, could, could you change that in some way? And then sometimes the loud mouth, the people who are talking all the time will say, yes, of course, I don't have to talk all the time. I was just trying to help you uh, solve all the problems. Or the negative one sometimes is not aware that they're negative. They just think that they are the critical voice. And um, Linda Rising, who is being interviewed after this, uh, wrote this book, Patterns for Fearless Change. And one of her patterns is the champion skeptic. And the champion skeptic basically is that you take somebody who's very uh, negative or critical towards something, and then you make them your champion skeptic. So you go to them between the retrospectives and you say, I've noticed that you're very good at being critical to things. So perhaps you can help me um, creating or planning retrospectives that work well for this team, because I've noticed that you're, you're laughing at me or you're laughing at the activities And perhaps you can help me plan the next retrospective so that we can do it in a way that works. And if you show people that respect that they might be able to help you, then they can be part of your journey. They can be your champion. And some of the most negative people I've had at retrospectives have become the most wonderful champion skeptics afterwards and have been talking about retrospectives as one of the best things since sliced bread. But you cannot do it in plenum. You have to do it one-on-one -on -one and you have to show them respect instead of saying you're an idiot, which you sometimes maybe want to say. You have to acknowledge that they just have another way of reacting to things than you have. Um, you, you mentioned some activities and retrospectives. Do you have a favorite activity to um, do in ret ret retrospectives? Yeah, I do. I, yes, I do. Well, I have different favorite activities for different settings. But let me give you two. Uh, my absolute favorite for, um, for just heartbeat retrospectives is the timeline where I just, I draw a line on the board or I have a timeline in a not in a document. And then people should, uh, they have a like five to 10 minutes to gather data, brainstorm on things that went well, things that didn't go so well, and then things that are in between or questions. And The reason why I like the timeline is because it's a very open general retrospective. It's not about um, the process or the, the learning or the test. That can also be good for some retrospectives, but sometimes I like this just open, let's just lift the carpet and see what's beneath. And I like the way that it uses colors because it allows people to stand away and sort of squint with the eyes and just look at, is this mostly positive or negative? I'm aware that some people are colorblind, but if you tell them which one is green and which one is red, they can normally tell the difference in general afterwards. So that's the timeline is uh, one of my favorites, but another one which is a favorite is um, the circles and soup or the circles of influence. Um, and the circles and soup or the circles of influence are, are basically that you just 
you draw uh, three circles. I'm just going to do it. You draw three circles here, or actually two. And uh, oh. <laughs> there, not that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Almost, well, it, it won't work. Anyway, you draw two circles. And in the innermost circle, these are the things that the team can do something about. And then the next circle are the things that they can influence and outside is the soup. And then sometimes when they have gathered data on a timeline, I notice that a lot of the things that they think are problems are actually somebody else's problem. It's not something they can do something about. And then I say, let's try the soup exercise. And I draw these circles on the whiteboard next to, or I have another online document that I can pull in. And then I say, let's take um, the problems that you have and put them into these circles of influence. And then we can look at how many you think you could do something about, how many you can influence and how many are in the soup. And that gives them the picture. It's like holding up a mirror to them and saying, what do you think, what do you see? And then sometimes some teams have, have gotten into the culture of just blaming other people, people outside the team. And most of what they are complaining about is in the soup. And that can be an interesting thing for the team to look at. That self-reflection can be really powerful. Okay, look at this. So most of the stuff that you don't like is somebody else's problem. It's not something you can do anything about. Could we perhaps in this retrospective focus on the things that we can do something about? I appreciate that there are some things that really annoys people and they need to vent about it. But maybe they just need to vent about it at every third retrospective, maybe not every time. And maybe they just have to accept that there are some things that they cannot change and say, well, these, this is irritating, but we can't change it. And we need to adapt the way that we work around it. As I said before, there's some problems you can solve, and then there's some problems you can't solve. And then perhaps if you have decided that you can't solve it, you just have to work around the symptoms instead. Um, we only have uh, three minutes left, so um, I would like to hear um, from you how to get more advantages from retrospective as an individual. So how can I get more advantages and how ca can the um, project benefit more from the retrospectives? Yeah, I think that one thing that's very important is that you hear from everybody in a retrospective. And if you have somebody who's very shy or for some reason are very quiet, You need to figure out how can you get the information out of their heads. You probably know that when you ask a question in plenum, some people will answer immediately and some people will not. But it is very important to hear from the people who are not answering. So if you yourself are shy, maybe you should tell the facilitator, could we have some activities that enables me to just write on post-it notes or that enables me to talk in smaller groups, maybe only two and two, um, and then my partner or the other people in the group can feed back to the plenum discussion because it's difficult for me to say something. Uh, so you're, you have a responsibility, I think, to try to understand yourself and help the facilitator get the most out of you because people in general, um, are, they have got like, there's two different overarching types of brains. There's the reflective brain and the active brain. And for the ones who are reflective, they need to think about things on their own before they blurt out with an answer. And then we have the active thinkers who are just, uh, they can't think unless they're talking. You probably know a few of those. And, and they, they seem to just start talking immediately when they have a problem. And then they just talk through it or do something about it. And then it seems like they're the only ones with the answers if you ask in plenum. But if you allow other people the time to think, and that's why One of the reasons why I like the timeline where they're sitting silently and writing on post-it notes on their own individually before we start talking about it together. Thank you very much uh, for your retrospective introduction and for the tips and tricks. Um, the next interview is with Eberhard and Linda Rising. Um, it starts in six minutes from now on and it's about fearless change. So thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, Lisa.
So, uh, welcome to the actually very last part of uh, Software Architecture Stream from OP Conference. And it is my, my pleasure and honor to welcome Linda Rising. Uh, so, Linda, do you want to say a few words about yourself and, and what you're working on? Sure. First of all, thanks for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to be a part of this conference. It's a struggle, we know, for all of us to attend one more Zoom meeting. So I'm grateful that people have thought that it was worthwhile to attend a keynote or hear what I have to say. So my name is Linda Rising. I live very close to Nashville, Tennessee. That is called Music City in the United States. And even in these challenging times, we have a lot of music in Nashville. And I am part of that because in addition to being uh, interested in software development, I'm also a musician and I direct several musical groups that are still going. Uh, so that's that's great. And, and we just spent some time uh, talking about that. Uh, so so um, that's yeah, that's that's very, very nice. Uh, what you're also known for is uh, fearless change. So so what is that? Fearless Change is a book that was published in the year 2005. That's a long time ago for any kind of technical or business book, and it is still selling. There was also a follow-on book, More Fearless Change. It came out in 2015. So if you do the math, you can see that there was a 10-year gap between those mm. two books. And what you can't see is the 10 year period before that first book. Each one of those books took my co-author, Mary Lynn Manns and me 10 years. So the two of us together have spent 20 years looking at how you introduce new ideas. How do you get people to listen to you? How do you get people to pay attention to your ideas? what kinds of techniques are valuable. And to do that, we use the vehicle of patterns. So these are patterns for helping people introduce new idea into organizations. And that's pretty much what the two of us have been spending the last 20, almost now 30 years producing these two books. So it's basically your your knowledge and your experience summed up. So so it's uh, it's it's certainly a, a valuable tool. There's also a game about it, right? Yes, and we were lucky enough. We met Deborah Pruce along the way, and in the year 2011, she attended a conference on games. She got together with several people at that conference, and they invented or created a game based on the patterns in Fearless Change. Their game is called Fearless Journey, and you can go to their website, Fearless Journey, and look at the cards, how the game is played. They have done more, I think, to advertise the patterns in Fearless Change than any other person except for Mary Lynn Manns and me. I have played the game, it's interesting, it's fun, and it's different. It's not what I would have thought of as a way to introduce these patterns, but it's very effective. Yeah, and uh, so there is the website. I think it's uh, fearlessjourney.info, and uh, we'll we'll put the um, the link to it in in the show notes. And also there are the cards, uh, yeah. and I still have them with me. So so I think you gave them to me. As when when I was doing that that workshop uh, that you gave at at uh, Joe conference, I don't know when. Um, yeah. so, and and you can download them from the website, right? So there is on each yes. of the cards there is there is um, there is one of the patterns and uh, the pattern and and you had us uh, think about how you can apply each of those patterns to to a specific challenge that we had, right? I think that that's yes. what we did in, in the tutorial. Yes, exactly. So we didn't create those cards. I think a couple of other people who were interested in the patterns found that having the cards 
each card having a different pattern help them to work with the patterns, make a plan for the patterns, remember the patterns. Just there's something about a real card. A lot of this reminds me of the research in the 80s that Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham did when they were talking about CRC cards for object-oriented design. And they said, watching people with the cards led them to understand that the card became the object. And people who were the designers gathered around a table, moved the cards around, looked at the interactions between the objects, and the cards enabled them to treat those software objects as real. Mm. They could pick up the card and move it around. So that's a human thing. We like real objects. We like to pick it up. That's why, yes, e-books are fine, audio books are fine, but there's something about holding a book, turning a page. The research is clear. We do a better job of learning in a situation where we have a real object. Right. So those cards, I think, are, are very useful. Right. Um, so it is something that we could play around with. And, and the, you just spoke about a CSE card. So that's, that's a good one. Uh, those are the cards where you, where, with class, right? Where you say this is the class of the object and then the R well, is for responsibilities and collaborations and with other, with other classes, yes. right? And, yes. Um, maybe something that, that I could pick up from it, and it's a good idea, is uh, you could do the same thing with bounded context from, from domain-driven design. You could basically, there are domain-driven design uh, bounded context canvas, so you could do something similar where you would lay out the, the bounded yes. context and, and play around with them. Yes. And you could do yes. it with, with Miro, right, these days, uh, as we are all locked in. Yep, yeah. yeah. exactly. We like real things and so when you have those cards and you find you can pick them up and move them around it enables your thinking about the idea the pattern the object whatever it is it makes it real and then when you move it around you can even see interactions how patterns or objects would work together it just gives your brain a framework for better thinking Right. So, um, but one thing that I'm wondering is, uh, so, so you said that, that you're working on uh, sort of uh, changing organizations for quite a long time. So I'm more like a software architect and a software architecture consultant, I would say. So why would I care about fearless change? How is that too useful for me? Because I mostly work on software, right? I don't yeah. work on organizations. Yeah. So... I used to believe exactly what you're saying. I can identify with that, that I've considered myself a technical person, mostly an architect or designer. And when I started working with Mary Lynn Manns, I thought the book would be technical. I thought it would be about technical solutions. What's a good way to organize the content mm -hmm. so that people can understand patterns and work with them. And I took so much time to realize finally that no matter what your job is, no matter what part you play on a team or in an organization, you are really a salesperson. You are selling your ideas, you're selling your competency, you're selling your expertise, and you're trying to convince other people that you're doing a good job, that you have good solutions for problems that come up. Mm -hmm. Everything you do is sales. I don't know if you're familiar with the author Dan Pink, but he wrote a book called Drive and several other books about how the brain makes decisions. And in one of them, he makes that statement, we are all in sales. We sell all day. And that's really what the organizational patterns are about. How do you sell 
your good ideas? How do you make sure that your ideas get the credence they deserve, that you are respected as mm -hmm. an expert? You do that with sales techniques. And that's really what these patterns are all about. I would not have said that 20 years ago. Mm. It took me 20 years to realize that that's the truth. It's a, it's a very good point. I mean, basically it says when, when you build an architecture and it's just on a piece of paper, it's just on a piece of paper and it, it doesn't do anything. So you have to sell it to people yeah. to actually adopt it. And, and I had a good, uh, I had a, I had a good uh, discussion with one of the uh, attendees of, of my, of my talk where basically I said, I can come up with a good architecture by myself quite quickly, but that doesn't solve the problem. And it seems that people are still uh, thinking that, you know, putting that architecture on a piece of paper, that's the job, but really it is about getting others on, on your side. Yes. And even if it's, if it's a wonderful idea, goodness, we know, is not convincing. Right. If goodness, if goodness were all that it took, then we wouldn't have so many bad ideas, not only political ideas, but technical ideas, many times bad ideas win the day and the good ideas lose. So goodness is not enough. Right. So if I look at the cards, it's actually quite a few of them. Uh, yeah. So do you have any like like a uh, favorite pattern or one pattern that that uh, you you want to explain a little bit about so to get an idea about what what these patterns are like and and uh, how they are useful? Okay, so my favorite pattern is do food. And it seems a little trivial that food is influential but we are deeply hardwired to be more open to ideas, to listen to others. When we are sharing food, there are even some languages like French where the word for friend, compagnon, mm -hmm. means someone with whom I break bread. So this is so deep in us, it is hardwired to trust, to listen, to care about anyone who is telling us a story about a good idea if we are sharing food, if we're having a cup of coffee together or a glass of wine or a piece of cake or mm. bread. So sharing food is not just a good idea. There is now scientific evidence. There have been experiments that show people are more open to influence when they are eating. So, so of course, all patterns have downsides. If you use that too much, you can overdo it. In the United States, we have an enormous problem with obesity. And of course, now we are all on lockdown and most people are eating too much. Of course, there are side effects. Right. But if you use that prop, that pattern wisely, you can bring people to be more open to what you have to say. So do food is my favorite. And it basically, so you could do a brown bag session or something to present your new architecture. And here is, here is the card. So you could sure. use that card and try to think about how you can use it for your architecture and you can take the next card and think again and so on. So that's how, how this works. Um, yes. I want to, to sort of switch subjects a little bit because, um, your, your keynote at OP was about yeah, maybe a different subject, but, but we'll have to figure that out. So it was uh, about arguing that the, the rational mind is just the ride of the much larger elephant. So that's, that's a good metaphor with this large elephant and there is this small rider on top of it. And uh, the rational mind is the rider of the emotional unconscious mind. 
Um, so and we, we should we should give credit to Jonathan Haidt because okay. it is his metaphor. So Jonathan Haidt said this is a good way of thinking about how the brain behaves. And then Chip and Dan Heath, who have together, they are two brothers, have written a number of very popular books. They used that. They adopted that metaphor in a book called Switch that sold an enormous number of copies. The Heath brothers seem to have a formula for doing that. And so it wasn't my idea. I just liked it. I have read those books and I thought this could be a helpful way to think about how the brain operates. And uh, are they psychologists or, or what is their, their profession? So, so where, where does yes, that... Jim Sorry, Jonathan Haidt is a researcher, a psychologist. He's a university professor. And Chip and Dan Heath are both professors as well at different universities, but they are more business oriented. So their applications that they talk about and the kinds of things they're interested in are more for business applications. Right. Um, so when when I do what what I do usually do, which is talk about architecture, uh, it's it's a discussion where you know there is some some solution, and we talk about uh, the the challenges that this solution is supposed to to solve, and you know the the advantages and disadvantages of that specific architecture. So that's a perfectly rational discussion, isn't it? So how does that influence my my uh, day to day work? So you've never had an architectural discussion with someone who disagreed with your ideas or your analysis, who said, no, that benefit is not a benefit at all because we're not interested in the thing you just talked about. We care about something else. And so you had a disagreement about that rational analysis. That's never happened to you. Yeah, but again, I mean, what, what you're saying it's, uh, is it's a rational discussion, right? It's about how this benefit is not a benefit. It's in fact not a benefit. And, you know, you can you can discuss it on, on the rational uh, level. So obviously I'm playing the devil's advocate here. So that's clear. But uh, no, that's good. Yeah, that's right. absolutely good. Absolutely so, good. Because it point it points out something very important, which is we all, not just architects, but we all think we are rational. We believe that. We think we see reality, that we understand the situation, the problem, whatever is going on. We think we see that clearly and that our conclusions follow logically. We all believe that. If someone disagrees with us, well, then they are the ones who are irrational. Those people on the other side, whether it's politically or technically, those people who don't agree with us, who think that our ideas are not good, who don't understand our arguments, well, they are the ones who are irrational. So, and... So what you're saying is that they might be even they might be rational or yeah they might be rational after all even though I think that that they might be uh, thinking the wrong thing. Um, so so yeah. is there some some kind of concrete thing that I should be doing in that situation where there seems to be this rational discussion about how what I propose is a bad idea for some rational arguments? So should I what should I do? in that situation. Uh, maybe I, I realize that there is some kind of deadlock and I don't believe that this is actually a truly uh, sensible argument. So I believe that maybe I'm, I'm at the end of some rational discussion. So what shall I do now? How, 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 how can I make that, that knowledge that there is this elephant in the mind of all of us? How can I make that usable? 
So one thing I think you have to realize and is very difficult is to see that you only have a very small slice of a view of reality. You don't see everything and that you are biased. Mm -hmm. You take in a lot of information, but your elephant makes sure that the only kind of data you really listen to or hear is something you already agree with. That's called the confirmation bias. We can look at a lot of wide ranging information, but we will filter it. We will make sure that the only thing we pay attention to is what supports our point of view. So there have been so many experiments around that bias. The most famous has to do with two groups of people who disagree on an issue, and it could be anything, a technical issue, a political issue, a religious issue. And both groups are given a paper that has data from scientific experiments about the two points of view. So two groups disagree, read the same paper. And the people in both groups always say the same thing, which is this paper supports my point of view. Now, if they disagree and they read the same paper, how can they say that? And the answer is they only accept the information that supports them. The other information, they either don't see it, they discard it, they overlook it, they denigrate it. Your brain will find a way mm -hmm. to throw out anything that you disagree with and only accept the information that supports what you believe. So, so you, ha you have to begin with that. You have to say that is how my brain operates. So when I deeply believe in something, my only hope is to talk to the other person who disagrees with me to say, help me understand how you see the world because I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. So you have to talk to their elephant. So that means that in, in the situation that you that you just mentioned, I should probably try to take myself in, uh, how do you call it, in, in uh, their shoes and try to understand what, what their position yes. is and, and yes. uh, try to, to sort of rationally uh, understand what they're thinking about and not uh, argue with them, but first try to, or maybe tr try to understand that position. Yes. Okay. So yes, that... because you cannot, you cannot change other people. You cannot argue with other people if they deeply care. Of course, if, if you're trying to talk about a brand of toothpaste, yes, you could say, oh, this new toothpaste is better. You should try it. Your old toothpaste is not doing a good job. Most people would be interested in that. But if it's something they really care about, an idea they have that they really believe is good, then they will not listen to facts. Mm -hmm. So you have to begin by saying, I don't agree with you. I don't understand this. Can you, and we were talking early about Noam Chomsky. Can you help me be curious about that? And what you are doing is leading them to think, helping them think about their point of view or their solution or their idea. And in thinking about it and explaining it to you, sometimes they begin to realize, ah, I hadn't thought about that. Let me think about this. Not because you pointed it out, but because now they see it in explaining it 
and doing their thinking out loud with you. Right. And, and another thing that, that I just noticed, because you, you said uh, that this problem arises in particular if, if you're already convinced about the solution. So what I, what I seem to be doing is uh, not try to think about a solution, but try to understand the problem at hand and try to, to understand what other people are suggesting as a solution so that I'm, so maybe that is some, do you think that is something that helps try to not be um, convinced about an architecture and a solution and try to sort of have your head clean and and try to think about the problem first, understand the problem, understand the other solutions that are proposed? Does that help? Yes, exactly. And in fact, it's a, one of the techniques that you can find in behavioral economics is to say, let me see if I can explain your idea to you. And if you can do it so well that the other person says, yes, you have explained it better than I could, then you'll know, aha, now I think I understand what you are thinking. Because mm -hmm. usually we go into the discussion believing that we understand the other side or the other point of view when we do not. Okay, so, so that's maybe a, a, a very good point. So uh, Axel Hecht on YouTube just said, uh, objectively, objectivity is totally subjective. So that's, that's probably a good one. But <laughs> yeah, um, but what I really, so you, you mentioned Noam Chomsky and uh, I mean, he is, he is impressive, right? Because he started off as a linguist and did that basic research on computation ability. And I learned about him from, from in, in theoretical computer science. And nowadays he is a, I would say political thinker or intellectual maybe. So, uh, and, and there was a question after your keynote uh, that Jutta was um, uh, forwarded me. Uh, and the question was, can you agree with Noam Chomsky to not try to convince people, but make them think? Yes. Um, so what do you think about that? I think it's, a, it's an interesting point. Yes, absolutely. Because when you disagree with someone, usually our first instinct is to argue. And we want to rationally show the other person how wrong they are. Oh, you, you don't agree with me because you don't understand. You obviously are missing some pieces of this solution. Let me explain it to you. And instead, Chomsky and others have said, we should go into those discussions with number one, curiosity. So I'm not sure I understand your idea, but I'm curious. Can you help me understand what you're thinking and what you're doing with that is leading the other person to think. Because now they must answer your curiosity. Let me see if I can help you. Let me see if I can make it easier for you to understand mm -hmm. what I believe. And so they have to clarify their own thinking. Which... So Chomsky was exactly right. That's exactly what you want to do, because when you make them think, now they must run through the idea, evaluate it, see it from a different point of view. I'm, I'm not explaining this very well. Linda doesn't seem to understand, so I'll have to rethink it. And in doing that restructuring of their thinking, they can come to see the world differently. Yeah, so not because you told them, not because you argued with them, because they're doing it on their own to help you because you're curious. 
and it basically me i mean that's that's the other thing uh, if you if you're able to to explain something it means that you have really understood it so by asking them to explain it to you you make sure that they have actually understood it and they rethink and maybe under, see that they have haven't understood specific pieces and it's also even though that is really high level i see a lot of and it seems pretty abstract i have to admit that i see a lot of uh, connections to what I think I'm doing, like asking questions, trying to understand and not coming up with a solution, but rather, and that is why, why I wanted to, to have this, uh, but make them think in, in our conversation, because that's actually what I want them to do. I don't want to come up with a solution. They should come up with their solution and they should probably so and you know I, I can give some input like have you thought about that have you thought about that and what you said can you explain it to me and that way we get um, sort of to the next level and it's a different type of or a different way of doing architecture work I think and I, I think I think if we go back to the Greeks that's exactly what Socrates did he invented or created this way of leading people not by arguing with them or outlining what the solution should be, but by asking good questions. And he knew, he knew where he wanted to go, but he wasn't explicit about it. He would ask a question to make the person who was listening to him think and in their thinking and reorganizing, they would come to a better understanding of what the problem was. So this is very old, this technique. It's thousands of years old. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, not too long ago, uh, I, did, I did an episode on uh, software architecture and stream uh, with my colleague Johannes Seitz about uh, Socrates and and his way of, of teaching people so um, it is something that uh, that uh, seems to be well how do you actually, it, it's an idea that seems to be in the air and and several people seem to to think the same way and, and seem to apply the same principles I think I think too that if you look at how the brain operates when someone comes at you and they tell you, they have a list of facts or they have a logical argument, then you immediately begin to resist and you want to fight back or argue against them. Where if somebody comes to you with a question, I wonder about this, or have you thought about that? Or I'm not sure I understand, or I'm curious about this. Can you, then now your brain, instead of fighting back is open to also wondering, oh, I wonder, I wonder how it is that maybe I can explain this better. Let me think about that. And so it is, as Chomsky said, you are making them think. Yeah, so maybe a sort of a, a good thing is to stay hungry, stay curious, what, what Steve Jobs, uh, I think, said at, at, at one point. And that is what, yes. what we should be doing. Um, yes. So we are even slightly over time. So is there anything else you want to add? Anything that, that I forgot to mention or to ask you? Anything that, that you want to say to, to the audience? I think we, we didn't talk about easier path uh, and it fits with the elephant metaphor because sometimes we are so focused on trying to convince people to do something or or um, adopt a certain idea when it may just be simply make it easy for them to do it. Make their lives easier if they do what you want them to do. And it, it, you don't care whether they actually believe in it or whether they're convinced that it's a good idea as long as they do it. And what the behavioral scientists tell us is once people behave in a certain way, then their beliefs follow later. So it's it's so it, it, it's this idea of, of nudging, right? So trying to, to nudge yes. them in, in, a, in a certain direction. And, yes. uh, and, and, it's, and, it, and it can be that. simple, just a very simple thing. 
that makes it easier. The elephant doesn't want to walk uphill all day or stumble in potholes or trip over rocks. No, it should be a nice, easy, smooth downhill path with some peanuts. It's so easy. Why would you not want to do this? So maybe that's another thing for it. It should be easy to follow uh, the architecture and to follow the, the advice that you're giving and, and the ideas that you're making. Yeah. I'm just trying to find, I don't seem to be able to find the pattern, but that's about... Easier path was in, is in more fearless change. Oh, I see. So it's not, it's not in my cards. So that's, that's the reason why I can't find it. You'll have to make a new card. So there is my homework. Okay. Yeah. So, um, let me take a look at, at the chat still. Uh, probably also shows differences in nomenclatura and misunderstanding. So that's another good one that you can uh, see how we can, how we can sort of uh, clean up those misunderstandings when we talk to one another uh, and try to explain it. And that's, I think the last comment that I got. So I think we are, well, we are done. And as I said, we are slightly over time. So thanks a lot for spending the time with me uh, and uh, with Thank our you. audience and uh, giving us these uh, insights on, on fearless change and uh, the elephant. So thanks a lot and, and have a great day uh, over in, Thank you. in the States. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.